more than one person said, well, what's emotional abuse really? And it turns out that emotional abuse is actually has longer term mental health impact than physical abuse. Hmm. It's exceptionally damaging, but it's not that well understood. Welcome to a new episode of Wish I Knew That Before. I'm your host Amit Pandey and here we bring on guests from different walks of life to discuss ideas, answer questions that can directly help a young adult navigate the journey of life a bit better. Our guest for today's show is the CEO of the One Love Foundation. One Love is on a mission to educate young people about healthy and unhealthy relationships, empowering them to identify and avoid abuse and learn how to love better. The foundation was started in the memory of Yardley Love, a 22 years old student at the University of Virginia who was killed by her ex-boyfriend in her dorm. Under our guest leadership, One Love's peer-to-peer educational workshops have reached over 1.1 million young people in person and over 100 million people have engaged with their online educational platform. Her TED Talk, on the difference between unhealthy and healthy relationships has garnered close to 10 million views and was amongst the most popular TED Talks of 2019. A Harvard Business School graduate, in the pursuit of finding purpose in her job and penchant for solving big problems, she joined the Michael J. Fox Foundation for Parkinson's Research and served as a CEO for her last three out of nine years over there. She was a longtime family friend of the Love family and initially supported One Love as an advisor. And in 2014, she decided to come on board as CEO. What brings her alive in this role is almost every other day getting a message from someone that One Love saved their life or changed it for good. A true believer of Howard Truman's quote, don't ask what the world needs. Ask what makes you come alive and go do it. Because what the world needs is the people who have come alive. So please help me in welcoming the woman who believes in living a purposeful life, who is on a mission to create a better society, the brave, the bold, the authentic, Katie Hurt. Yay! (laughs) Thank you so much for that nice introduction. I'm so happy to be here. I am beyond excited to to have you on the show and... um, the topics that we are uh, going to discuss, it's its super close to my heart. And uh, I think it will provide so much value to everyone who would be listening to it. Kitty, you know, like, as I, as I mentioned about um, Yadri's story, what I want to know is if you can walk us through what happened to Yadli and how, what, what, what really made you so passionate about this mission and how you got involved? Sure. So um, I guess I'll start. Well, with Yardley, Yardley was born and raised in Baltimore, Maryland. She went to the University of Virginia, where she was a lacrosse player. It's the only school she wanted to go to. Um, And she was in a relationship, an off and on relationship that had finally ended with her um, ex-boyfriend. When on the night of May 3rd, he broke down her door and beat her to death. The reason I was originally connected to this is I never knew Yardley. I never knew her mother, Sharon, or her sister, Lexi, but her cousin, Sharon, is one of my best friends. So on that morning, I was home. I'd had a baby the week before. I had a week old son. And I got a call saying, you need to get to Sharon's house because her cousin's been killed. And I remember that moment because um, you never expect to hear that. You just never expect to hear it. I didn't even ask any questions. I just ran out the door, jumped in the car, went down the hill, walked in the front door and found my friend Sharon with her three young kids. She was totally in shock and she mouthed the words to me because she did not want the kids to hear them. He broke down the door and he beat her to death. And I remember that moment. I always tell that story because of a couple things. First, my mind was blown. Like I... I never in a million years, when I was driving down the hill, I never thought, I thought about drugs. I thought about drinking. I thought about a head injury. I thought about a car accident. I did not think that a kid at the University of Virginia, just about to graduate, would be beaten to death by her ex-boyfriend. So it was shocking to me. I actually didn't have space in my brain for that. And I remember realizing in the days that followed as I learned more, because I'm a pretty curious person, that one in three women 
nearly one in three men and one in two trans or non-binary people will be in abusive relationships in their lifetime. Whoa. And yet it's this big epidemic that no one, we're all connected to and no one's talking about. Right. So I also tell the story because the, I think sometimes when we read these stories in the news, you think somebody must have known something. Somebody must have thought she was at risk. And having been there that day, this was a shock. There was no scenario where her family had any idea that this was even possible. So to think that this could happen, you go from, you know, weeks away from graduation to dead in, yeah. in hours, it made no sense to me. So how did I get passionate about it? Um, well, I think the first thing is I had this awakening about why is no one talking about this issue? Like, why is the stigma so great that we just like pretend it happens to other people and not us. It's not relevant to our lives. It's super relevant for our lives. The stats mm. show that we all know somebody who will be a victim of abuse. So that was the first thing. And I, I would say as for me as a person, I like big, I like trying to figure out creative ways to solve big uh-huh. problems. Uh-huh. And all of a sudden I realized there was a new big problem I hadn't spent a lot of time thinking about. But I would say the second thing is in the, in the weeks and months and years that followed, I did get to know Yardley's mom and her sister, but her mom in particular, I spent time with um, to try to help her figure out what she wanted to do to honor Yardley's um, legacy. And one night we were just, I don't know, brainstorming. And she said, turned to me and said, I want to do for this issue what Mothers Against Drunk Driving did for drunk driving. I want to Mm -hmm. teach people um, that shift the stigma from the abused to the abuser. And I want to teach bystanders to take away the keys. And I had been like writing notes and all of a sudden I was like, well, that's <laughs> awesome. And all of a sudden I sort of had this, Oh my gosh, we have a big problem. And maybe we have an approach that mothers against drunk driving and other groups use that actually work. They dropped deaths by drunk driving by 55% over 30 years. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden it was like, wow, big problem and possible solution. And I got excited from that point on. Right, right. Whoa, that's, that's, that's phenomenal. I mean, um, the way you walked us through the, the stats, the, the way you got involved and question that comes to my mind from like, when I, when I hear to that is, one thing is the family for uh, of Yardley, they didn't know at that time, like, why is this happening? Um, and they didn't have any idea um, when it happened. Why do you think people are not so sure to talk about this? And is it is it because they don't know what to talk? Or is it okay to normalize? Like, what's going on over there? Oh, I think there's so, it's such a good question. I think there's so many things going on. So what I would say is, and I left this out before, but In the weeks that followed and up through the trial, his trial in 2012, the family started learning more about what people had seen. And it turns out, I always say now that if a domestic violence expert had been dropped in the middle of that friend group, they would have understood that there was emotional abuse going on, there was increased volatility and intensity, and that the danger was ratcheting up. But because she was in her senior year, hanging out with her friends from university, None of them had been trained about the signs. So they called it different things. So it sounds overly simplistic, but there was a language problem. They called it drama. They called it too much drinking. They didn't call it domestic violence. They didn't call it relationship violence. And so they couldn't connect the dots and get to the resources that they needed. So that was the real idea that, um, that we started launching with is how do we empower friends to understand what they're seeing and know what to do? But your second question about why people, the other factor is people don't like to talk about this. I, mm. I've come to think that the idea that somebody you love or that loves you or your friend could hurt you is like one of the most fundamentally threatening ideas in the world. Yeah. Yeah. And so we prefer to have stereotypes about who is affected by this and who this happens to. And we never think it's us. We, and especially when you're yeah. in your 20s, especially when you're 22 years old you're not, that's not domestic violence. That's just like passion or that's like whatever it is. But it's all these words that aren't quite right. Um, I think the the third thing is we have normalized violence in our society. Um, and in particular, emotional abuse has been a very poorly understood type of abuse. Hmm. When I started this job, um, people would ask me the stats and I would say, you know, one in three, nearly one in three, one in two, And they would say, well, what does that mean? And I would say, well, it's emotional abuse, physical abuse, and sexual abuse. 
And more than one person said, well, what's emotional abuse really? And it turns out that emotional abuse is actually has longer term mental health impact than physical abuse. Hmm. It's exceptionally damaging, but it's not that well understood. And so putting all these things together, what we realized is that One Love had an opportunity to create teaching tools that would fill this language and understanding gap, that would talk to kids in a language they could hear, showing them like films that reflect their lives and their realities, that would reduce the stigma about having these discussions. And specifically, we realized that would that would really highlight what emotional abuse is mm-hmm. and when unhealthy relationships become abusive is usually in that emotional space when Mm -hmm. all of us will do unhealthy things in our relationships and all of us will have unhealthy things done to us. But when they become patterns and they don't end, they become abuse. So if we can teach people what's unhealthy, teach people, inspire people to want to be healthier and teach people to understand when what is unhealthy has become abuse, then we think we can, um, we can change the stats ultimately over time. 100%. 100%. I think I think um, that's one of the best ways to go about it. And one of the primary things, as you, as you mentioned, that nobody in their 2020 or 22, they think that, um, you know, like, oh, yeah, because it's, it's easier to say things that, oh, it's over drinking, because that's what you have been observing before with the people around you talking about it. And there needs to be a change in the language. There needs to be a change in that. And I think One Love is providing them the tools and the resources to just talk about. Because a lot of times you might see that we we are okay to talk about our emotions. Like this made me f- mad or, um, you know, we talk, we label our emotions. But a better way, like how did it make you really feel? Like get better with your vocabulary around. I think, I think that is one of the best ways to go for it. One, one of the question that uh, came to my mind is also that um, you talked about emotional abuse. I think that's one of the biggest things that uh, it also ties it up with your line that you said that 100% of us will be on the giver side as well as on the receiver side. So let's talk about emotional abuse a bit more. Like what, what are the signs? Because on your blog, you have 10 signs of unhealthy relationships. Let's talk more about few of the unhealthy relationship signs, uh, specifically relating to um, emotional abuse? Uh, Well, so I think the really important, when we started out, what uh, our first products really tried to show how abuse unfolds and someone can end up being killed. And And we did this working with researchers at Johns Hopkins who said that abuse follows a pattern. And it's human. It's a human pattern. It's not everybody's different. There's a pattern and emotional abuse and isolation are the first phase where people sort of pull, pull someone away from their friends and family towards them. And then this cycle of control sort of begins. And um, I always think of emotional abuse as like from the, from Alice in Wonderland, like falling down the rabbit's hole. Mm -hmm. Emotional abuse is very confusing. Emotional abuse is a lot of like push and pull, like, you'll have a huge explosive fight and somebody will call you names and I don't even know why I spend time with you and this, that, and the other. And then they come back the next day with a, you're the only person who understands me. If so much damage has been done to me in my life, I need you. So there's a shove away and pull back. And I think about um, that a lot as being about control. So the person who is abusive wants to see that they sort of like it's, it's a really sick love. They want to know that they push you away. They can pull you back in, push you away, pull you back in. Mm. But that push and pull is very confusing for if you're in it. Mm. Because when you're pulled back, you see the best of that person. You see the person that you fell in love with. You see the person that you want to be with. But then you're shoved away and you're despondent. So it's a very, it really helps. It, me, it means that people lose their footing. They don't know what to trust. They don't know if they should trust their gut. They, they lose their ability to sort of, not totally, but frequently Mm self-advocate. So our goal was, okay. And and I would say once somebody is in an emotionally abusive relationship, it is very difficult to leave. On average, a person trying to leave an abusive relationship will try seven times before they can successfully leave. So what we thought about when we were thinking about what's the solution to this is we have to get ahead of abuse. We actually need to shine a light on what are the unhealthy behaviors that can become abuse so that what you recognize them from the start so yeah, that when yeah. you're sitting down at your you know if you're on a date or if you're on chatting on social media and you realize like 
actually that's belittling. Like they're making me feel less than, or they're making fun. They always make fun of me. You observe it from yeah. the start yeah, when yeah, you yeah. Know, advocate for yourself and say, I don't know if you realize this, but I feel like you're belittling me and it's hurting my feelings and it's hurting our relationship. And you can see, oh, can we fix this? Or is this person going to keep going? So that's, so our whole idea is let's get ahead of when it becomes abuse to the place where you're just starting out in a relationship so that you can say, wow, like this person's super possessive or wow, they never take responsibility for their actions or Hmm. man, they are volatile. They're riding the roller coaster all the time. Hmm. Hmm. We can teach these early signs. Then people still have their footing and they can make the decision to, to stay and work to make it better or decide this person's not for them before it becomes abuse. So in every way, I'm sure that sounds like overly simplistic, but I actually, I, in my prior life, I worked in science and Mm -hmm. Parkinson's disease, and that is so much more complicated. This is about giving people a language and and you used the word earlier about emotions. I, I do frequently say, I feel like we're giving people a language to describe what was formerly only coded as feelings. Mm-hmm. and instincts mm-hmm. yeah, um, yeah. And, and that's that's sort of our shot on goal and what we think will make a difference in young people's lives oh 100 I, I i think i think you're absolutely right about um providing a language like i'm an engineer and i know um when i when i work on codes it becomes tough if i don't know the language so 100 language is very very important one of the primary things i feel that um you know, like as as they always say that uh, as kids, we we like learn through observing a lot, you know, and uh, it's it's not that our parents or, or someone else would actually sit down and talk to us about, oh, this is love or that's not love. You know, all of those things giving us, providing us the language. And what ends up is we learn so much just by observing through movies, you know. I think I think especially in my life I was so much influenced by movies uh, because primarily I come from India and in India these topics to talk about are not very comfortable especially in in, in the house like sex this thing or, or drugs all of those things are a taboo you know as you said like everyone thinks that's not going to happen to my child why should I even bother to talk about it but it's it is happening everywhere so I I got so much messed up with the idea of love and just like trying to observe and do things that is shown in the movies not even sitting down sitting back and thinking no like what is love what does it mean to me you know i i i um, when i was researching about one love i came across the the point that you mentioned the emotional highs and emo- the lows you know the intensity i thought the big bollywood actor shahrukh khan he does it all the time <laughs> Yes, of course. I'll do it too, you know. <laughs> and and I specifically remember an incident. I was in a, in a relationship with a girl. And I specifically remember an incident where we were having an argument. And I don't know what happened to me. Um, I was very emotionally uh, hurt by her comments. And I thought that, oh, can't you see that I'm being getting hurt? And I think it would have been subconscious somewhere in my mind that I thought it's better to uh, grab hold of her hand and tell her, like, you know, shake her that, oh, you're hurting me. And I did that. And she, I'm sh- I'm glad that it didn't escalate ahead because she in that very moment told me that, hey, you're hurting me, stop this. And I took a step back and I thought, dude, what are you doing? What are you doing? You know? Yeah, I mean, well, the relationships are hard. I mean, it's, and this is why I think it's also really important. Like we've created this, idea that there's like abusive people and there's victims. Mm -hmm. And again, that lets us shove people into camps, but that's not helpful. Like relationships are hard. Emotions are real. Mm -hmm. We all make mistakes. Mm -hmm. So we have to know if that's what we're walking into. I'm a, I'm a mom of four kids. If we, if I know that and I teach my kids that then teaching people to speak up and teaching people to, to say, I know giving them the confidence to know that that's not okay. Mm-hmm. Not just when somebody shakes you, yeah, but when yeah. somebody does some of these emotional things, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. then mm-hmm. I think we are empowering our kids. I think you're, I a hundred percent get your point about um, the stigma yeah. and also just different, different cultures also have different attitudes towards um, this topic. Yeah. But I also think all parents, we empower our children by making this something that we talk about with them and that we're just really like almost non-emotional about like statement of fact, abuse is very prevalent. Yeah. 
you need to be armed with the information to let mm. you understand what's unhealthy and what's healthy and what to do if you need help. To me, it's almost like it's not as simple as a vaccination for sure. Oh, yeah. Because again, <laughs> relationships are hard. 100%. But I do think it, I do think it's it's a level that all parents can give their young people, which mm. is important. No, 100%. I think I think as you said like there are so many layers to us as a human. Yeah, it's 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 not just putting people into two camps as victim and abuser. It's as as you said that in a way we all have been abused in a way we all have been uh an abuser. And there are subtle ways that we often do it and we think oh we are not abusing anyone. What are you talking about? You know, we always do that. Yeah, but it's very important and especially bringing it to our awareness that this is what it is. Um even though it's a slight manipulation even though i'm doing this to get my way done um but it is not healthy and just bringing it to awareness is super duper important one of the things that um people usually use and i saw it on 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 your blog is we will use the word i love you and i'm sorry you know talk talk to me about that like how do people use it some examples around it well i mean i think that um that cycle of like uh push and pull gets mm-hmm. a lot to this um and and by the way the words i love you and the words i'm i'm sorry are super important yeah, yeah. and they're it's I'm super sorry. important when they are sincerely said yeah. they're super dangerous when they're manipulatively said yeah so sometimes people say i love you to get their way or to get out of an awkward moment and that's confusing and some people sometimes people say they're sorry when they're not really sorry mm-hmm. so i think this idea that um and i i would just use a personal example you know even doing this work every day i still make mistakes and my husband or my kids will be like that's not love <laughs> and what has changed is not it has the frequency of doing things has changed i would say but i also think what's changed is my recognition that sincere apologies are one of the building blocks of a healthy relationship and that when you can go back and i can say to my husband or say to my kids i am sorry that i flew off the handle i'm sorry i was intense I was frustrated at this. I'm going to use we teach our preschoolers to use yeah. their words, but frequently yeah. we let our emotions just come up like that. So I think the words I love you and I'm sorry are incredibly important, but you just have to make sure they're not being used in a mani- manipulative way. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I'm only apologizing because I want something from you or I'll tell yeah. you I love you because I want something from you. Then mm-hmm. that can be that can be uh, not so great. Yeah and I think I think um as you said like using it for manipulation and getting your way is 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 not good. Uh in one of the videos that uh was there on One Love's website is the Valentine Day gift, the store mm-hmm. that you guys created. I thought that was such a brilliant thing. Um it was fun to do too. <laughs> yeah, and it was it was such a beautiful thing that you got people into the door to think that oh it's going to be lovey dovey day Valentine Day and you guys exposed them to what signs are about an unhealthy relationship and how people use it that was that was brilliant one one of the question that um comes to my mind um is what like have you guys thought about like what causes someone to become abusive in a relationship i mean i th- i would not be probably the best i we don't spend a lot of time thinking about the causes mm-hmm. to be honest i think mm-hmm. there's many I think mm-hmm. sometimes you've grown up with poor models. Yeah. Um I think sometimes there's mental health issues that can lead someone to be abusive. Mm-hmm. None mm-hmm. of these are excuses because each person needs for to sure. take ownership for the way they behave in a relationship. But I think there's lots of things. Um I yeah. think that in you were talking about movies. I mean, this whole the whole way we describe like passion and romance mm-hmm. as mm-hmm. being like this yeah. like lurching thing is actually like not necessarily what a healthy relationship is built on a healthy relationship should, should be built on firmer ground so to speak mm-hmm. but when you're young and you're just figuring it out sometimes you get in the in the process you get in the habit of bad behavior so mm. a very common one these days would be we hear from the teens we work with you know basically checking each other's texts Oh. So yeah. having passwords to different yeah. accounts like yeah. that's actually not good. That's boundaries. Yeah. You need to have good boundaries between you and your partner. You should mm-hmm. not you should be have independent lives and love being together. Mm-hmm. But it's very very common. So mm-hmm. these things that aren't actually good become habits over time. Right. One of my favorite things um with when we're in a workshop or when we get a note on social media is when someone recognizes that they themselves have been doing the unhealthy behavior. Ooh. And why I love that and they say, 
oh my gosh, I do some of these things and I don't want to be abusive. Yeah. It's this real realization to me, two things that we are catching people. Honestly, that campaign you're talking about, the Valentine's one is love better. Love better. Yeah. We're catching everyone and assuming that all of us want to love better. We just all mm. need a little guidance. 100%. And I also think like non-judging and just saying, right. So now that you know, you tend to be insanely jealous. Mm-hmm. How are we going to work on that? Where mm. can you get help for that? Mm-hmm. So I think this idea of um, we worry more, less about the cause and more about the future. How do we change this? And now Mm, I'm not naive mm. enough to think that all abusive people can become changed. But if we teach folks to spot abusive behaviors and stay away, we're still going to affect the statistics Oh, because we'll teach people to avoid the folks that maybe aren't as easy to help. 100%. I totally agree. And as you said, like there is so much that we learn from movie, like they they show that love is supposed to be crazy, but love is not supposed to, you don't have to be crazy to fall in love, like all of those things, you know? Exactly. I couldn't agree more. And, and, And when it comes to like, people say that, oh, if I'm just checking your, uh, checking your text or give me a password or those things, just to show that you like you trust someone that's not the best way to show that you trust someone yes you're right those are little tests people put in like if you love me so one of our other campaigns is called because i love you Mm -hmm. it's those little tests or these little excuses that Mm. that in some ways are very normal yeah but we really should just change the way we look at them because it sets up um, unhealthy behaviors and habits in relationships for sure 100% 100% because these these are very difficult to just communicate you know so how can someone actually tell someone like their partner that hey you know what um, I don't feel comfortable doing this what's the best way to put put it forward well so I think this is hard because every relationship's different mm-hmm. um, what we hope is that by making it so like our dream someday is that relationship health is something that you learn the 10 signs in elementary school around your friendships in middle school around um, peer relationships, and then in high school and college around dating. And it becomes as ingrained in your head as one plus one equals two. Mm. So that instead of thinking, you know, Oh, I don't know how to talk about it. You're like, Oh yeah, this is something we talk about. This is something really important. And I'm a good friend when I talk about it. And I, this, we all want, that's the vision. So we'll see if we get there, but that's the idea. Mm -hmm. You make it just easy. If you, and that's why for us scale has always mattered. We don't want this to be a program that can only get to a few people. Cause if you're going to try to change every, if you're going to try, ch- try to change the stats, you have to change everyone's language. You have mm-hmm. to normalize this conversation for everyone. So we think a lot about scale and how we can push, make this something that every young person could learn um, in school. I think that, so that's the vision right now. I think it's a habit that you create from the beginning stages of your relationship. I think that the first time you know, and, and certainly some people might be like, oh, that's strange. He or she wants to have serious relationship discussions, like right when we're starting. But I mean, yeah. if you say, look, that was really fun tonight, but I really felt like your teasing was, it fe- it just was hurting me a little bit. Like I mm. felt like it was mm. a little over the top and you're always so nice to me when we're one-on-one, but then when we're in a group, I feel like you're sort of, I don't know, like making fun of me to get laughs. Yeah. That's a hard thing to say, but if you start just saying, Point, can we talk about it? An yeah, invitation yeah, to talk versus yeah, a lecture. Yeah, you'll learn a lot. You'll create habits within your own relationship that help you hmm. when the next thing happens. Not feel like your emotions rise. Like I've yeah. done something wrong. I'm getting accused. Be like, oh, this is what we do. Yeah. This is how we practice understanding each other. And yeah. you know, the, the huge phrase right now, especially in like the race space, and it's intent is not the same as impact. So hmm. you may find that your partner did not intend to tease you exactly. in a way that would yeah, hurt yeah, you. Yeah, 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 and they just yeah. needed to know that. No, I yeah. would never, and they'll be more careful next time. 100%. Or you might find over time that they're a real jerk and they, and, yeah. <laughs> and this is not a person you want to be with. Right. But yeah, I think yeah. it's practice. It's really practice. It's, hmm. it's um, the first, it's just knowing that the first time you try to have a conversation Will be will be harder than the second time you do will be harder than the third time you do. Hmm. So you just have to start, practice just like your first workout after a while it's yeah, painful, yeah 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 but the more you work out like the better it the better it becomes so i think yeah. it's the same thing just when it comes to relationships 
no 100% and, and, and i think i think that's epic on your side because you guys are not laying down rules for people to follow because we all are different human beings we the the our partners are different and there's no one size fits all solution but you are providing them the vocabulary now go and make your own sentences you know like have exactly it, yeah it's a framework so what framework, what i yeah. what i like to think is um and i've seen this happen it happened to me i mean the reason that i became the ceo is because i was an advisor and i was helping them how i could but they created their first film which was called escalation okay. and i remember they showed it to the advisory board and literally the hair on my arms was standing up straight because oh. i all of a sudden i understood my life experience better i i've never been in an abusive relationship but all of a sudden i realized that some of my friends maybe had that yeah. when you know it's a very common thing when with teens and early 20s relationships like you want to be together all the time so you yeah. sort of ditch your friends a little bit you, but there's that part that's healthy and normal and then one of the key hallmarks of an abusive relationship is isolation yeah where i had misunderstood that some of my friends who just disappeared i blamed them i didn't yeah. realize that it was actually their partner who was right. insisting right. and you'll hear things i talked about it a little bit at my ted talk like this negative chatter about your friends. I don't like them. They're not good mm -hmm. for you. They're totally mm -hmm. against us. Like mm -hmm. th this negative chatter serves to pull the person away from their support systems and closer to the controlling abusive person. Yeah. So I watched the movie and I realized, oh my gosh, if this just affected me this way, this could affect many people this way. Yeah. And we will do workshops. And I think it's, it's such an interesting and accidental, let me be the first to say, <laughs> like, you watch the film usually in a group obviously covid has sort of put a halt to that for now mm -hmm. but we'll be mm -hmm. back mm -hmm. and you are independently processing your own life against what you're seeing and then you get to sit in a group circle and actually have a conversation about it and mm -hmm. hear what other people are seeing and mm -hmm. then you have a facilitator who gives you key takeaways right. the process of internal processing and then turning around and having a peer discussion is it's really sticks with people. We hear from people years later. I still think about that workshop, the things I learned in that workshop I've carried with me. So I guess the point is, I think, you know, when it comes to um, one of the things that's working in our favor uh, is that the one thing we all have the most collective experience in is relationships. We've just never had a framework and a language through which to understand them. And, and the great epiphany over the last few years has been that th these 10 signs are not just relevant to dating relationships. Yeah. They're relevant to friendships and work relationships and every kind of relationship. And so um, it's exciting to see kids making those connections as we do the work. And, uh, you know, we'll see, you know, it, it's, yeah. it's good work. You feel like you're helping people every day. That's for sure. No, hundred percent. And I, I, as you said, like, there is so much co commonality in, in relationships. Obviously there are more layers to it, but there's so much commonality that if we become aware about it in one and, and especially like in during friendship, the, the stakes are not that high as compared to like intimate partners, you know, That's so if, right. you, if you start a bit early with understanding that how friends also can manipulate, right. How friends mm -hmm. also can manipulate in certain ways, slowly and steadily you'll, build up the vocabulary you'll build up the strength to talk more freely about these things and um yeah like just just try to minimize the cycle as much as it can you yeah. should work at one love <laughs> yeah <laughs> because that, <laughs> that idea i mean we have started to develop some healthy friendships yeah films and um creative because we're like, you're right. It's lower stakes in friendship. It still hurts. I mean, I have yeah, a middle school, hurts. I have kids in middle school. <laughs> I mean, it is the friend stuff is, is for real. Yeah, um, yeah. But if you can teach them the signs and teach them how to use their voice to speak up for themselves, mm -hmm. when they move on to an intimate partner, mm -hmm. they're going to recognize the signs faster. Yeah. yeah, yeah. They're going to see the patterns. They're going to yeah. know how to have the conversation yeah. and they're going to be more adept than they would have been if they hadn't. So we, we do think about moving younger in fact, when we started, we geared our programs towards college age kids. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They loved it, but they said, we needed this in high school. And the <laughs> high school age kids said, we needed this in middle school. Mm -hmm. And middle school and high school kids are saying, this is true for friendships too. So I think that's been one of the beautiful things about the work is it, it's really, it's relationships are part of nearly every one of our lives. Yeah. 
And no, none of us have ever really been given a structure and framework yeah. for thinking about the healthiness of them. Yeah. No, 100%, 100%. As you said, like relationships are part of all our lives and um, friendship. Or I also uh, think a lot about like parent-child relationship. So there are so many pointers that can come out of it. And it's better to talk it out, like communicate a bit better. Just sit down. If you, if you address things at the very start, it might be very awkward, as you said, like getting to the gym first time. But um, it will definitely build up that strong muscle of that relationship over the long time when the real hard times actually come you know but but another question when when i was discussing it with few of my friends that oh i'm going to be in uh, interviewing katie and this is the whole concept all about one of them we we spoke about the tolerance levels you know like when you're in a relationship it could be that my tolerance level is Mm, bet I wouldn't say better or greater, but maybe a bit higher that I might allow my partner to get away with this, but someone else might not allow um, their partner to get away with. When when to know that this is enough is enough, you know, like when to call quits. So I think that um, so you're you're a hundred percent right. Every situation is very different because mm -hmm. it's two different people involved mm -hmm. in the relationship. Mm -hmm. So, but part of being in a relationship is calibrating to each other. So mm. part of the relationship is as you get to know somebody, like what's a no go for me mm. and what, like, what's my, what do I love and what do I hate? And how does that compare to my partner and what's a no go for me and what's a, okay, I can tolerate that. Right. Like, yeah, yeah. and, and every combination is going to be a little bit different, but I think thinking about, I think thinking about relationships as you progress, it's not onto milestones, like. I don't know, like oh, we're exclusively, we're, we're talking, we're exclusively yeah. oh, seeing each other. I we're don't dating, understand that. I don't know. It, it's really about like <laughs> yeah. how much better are you feel, figuring out if yeah, you fit together? Yeah, 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 so yeah. one of the things that um, Yardley's mom and her family have always said is it's really important to learn to trust your gut. Mm -hmm. Like God gave us, in my opinion, God gave us a gut mm -hmm. for a reason. Mm -hmm. There is a physical feeling we have when something feels right or something feels wrong. It's very hard, especially when you're younger. I think, I think I've gotten better at listening to my gut as I've gotten older, but learning early to listen to that gut and trust it, it is, it is there for a reason. Mm. Um, if you find, so how to know when to break something off? Like if, if something continues to grate on you, you have tried to talk about it. You don't feel like your partner is ever going to move. Then I think the question is like, are you really meant to fit together if this is something that is like really causing you so much anxiety? One of the things we also want to figure out how to do is to how to, and this may be, this is really hard, but how do you establish with young people, you will break up in your life. You will oh, be broken yes. up with. Yeah, This is life. 100%. So the first person you date is most likely not the person you're going to end up with. So if you just de-emotionalize it a little, and it, if we taught kids how to break up healthy, which is one of our goals, yes. and to, to when somebody says, I'm just not sure this is working for me, instead of flying off the handle and flipping a table yeah. saying, okay, well, tell me more, like, or, and, I, and to respectfully part. Yeah. And I think these are just things we're not taught because we're taught loves like a you're, you're either, it's like a, it's a zero sum game. You know, you're yeah. either together or we're not, there's drama, yeah. there's this, there mm. are feelings involved. I'm not trying to, you know, the most painful breakups I've been part of are ones where one partner's feelings were just radically different from the others. Yeah. But if we could talk to our kids early and say, this is not if it happens, it's when it happens, you mm. will end up in a relationship where you're convinced this is the person you're supposed to be with. Mm -hmm. And they're not. So yeah. what are you going to do to have a mature conversation about that and say, I'm hurting, my feelings hurt, but I'm going to like, let you go, you know? And I think there's a lot of work to be done on this front and normalizing those conversations. hundred percent. And a lot of my friends, they, they always talk about how to break up better. And one of the key elements to that is like, you know, there, there's something called as um, conscious uncoupling. A lot of, uh, in, in divorce, they talk about it, like consciously we uncouple so that we don't have a lot of hatred and just like understanding that you both are on a different page and just talking about it and putting it using some framework around it. Uh, would Like a lot of times I have heard that people just ghost each other, you know. But, but you know, like I, I, I am super 
close in my friendship like my my ex girlfriend is my one of my best friends because we consciously decided that you know what like we both are on a very different page but the friendship like there was first friendship and then love and i never wanted to lose her as my friend and till today she is there in my life and she's like one of my best friends we talk about so many things so yeah it's 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 important that oh if you break up that's end of your relationship no like if there was friendship like try to save it or like just talk about it you know yeah so, well i think part of this though that's important mm-hmm. it really comes down one of the healthy values that we teach about is independence mm mm-hmm. sometimes especially when you're younger but not just when you're younger your identity actually gets more attached to the couple to the relationship than it does as two individuals who are in a relationship. So the stakes and I think we hear for this from young people a lot that on social media when they post pictures of themselves which by the way is usually only your highlight reel oh, um they get so many likes and so much like this is true love I'm so jealous like you know they get so much encouragement of the validation you know validation yeah yeah that they might stay with relationships longer than they really want to because they mm-hmm. almost get addicted to that like approval from others. Yeah. And I think that this independence like approaching relationships not like this person is and this is goes against like a lot of of young love ideas and I'm not so naive to think like oh see now that I've told you you'll get it. No. But like this idea of like being whisked off your feet and this is the person those are normal feelings yeah. yeah but the more we can talk to our kids early about you know every relationship that you're in your goal should be to if possible maintain the relationship if if you can find a way it might not be in the same it might be friendship instead of a dating relationship yeah but like go into it expecting i think we have this sort of like it's all or nothing like mentality yeah. that can really ratchet up emotions and can ratchet up dysfunction too i think yeah no i i i 100% agree um to that that it's 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 important to um like separate your identity it's it's okay to not do things all the time together uh, and i think that's that's very important to have yourself as an independent person um you know the role of technology in 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 relationships like i know there are huge advantage when it comes to a relationship to have a lot of technology around us but a huge part of it is it it also hurts our relationship so is is it just one thing that you said like we post a lot and we seek validation and approval from others or there are some other things as well where the technology is hurting us in today's life Yeah, I think that um well, I've a lot of things flying through my head. I I think that clearly technology can be used to stalk someone or mm. to track someone or mm. to keep mm. tabs on someone and um that is that I think is dangerous. Um a lot of people report that their partner has their find my iPhone on their phone so that they can Ooh. know where they are Ooh. at any time. That's you know that's not everybody but that we've definitely heard that before hmm. for me i think the the one of the biggest challenges with technology is it gives you ability to be in contact 24 hours a day 7 days a week i mean we've talked to young people who tell us that they literally sleep with facetime on with their partner whoa which is like that's i'm not i'm literally not making fun of that but it's how technology can be used hmm. to like maybe wear down boundaries a little bit. Um we know that like these Snapchat streaks and texting streaks and things like that it's a, there's a lot of intensity whereas in the old days not that I'm an old day fan but I am sort of <laughs> yeah. not that things were perfect in the old days but in the old days <laughs> there was forced distance like I didn't have a phone with me all the time so that yeah. meant I had space that meant when I was out with my friends I was out with my friends and there was mm. really no way for somebody to to who know where I was so yeah. I think independence is my biggest concern Yeah. Um I also think that the culture of uh distraction of technology mm. where oh. even when we're together like my husband and I will be at dinner sometimes and both of us are looking at our phone <laughs> what is that like you know I think um deepening relationships and relying less on the surface of like I I quit social media a couple of years ago which was a it was a little bit of a temper tantrum but it was because I went to my church and I 
walked in and I was feeling a little down and I said, I already know what all these people are doing because I see their pictures on social media. I don't feel like talking to anybody tonight. Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself, that is not healthy. Like human beings are designed to engage with each other, not with screens. Mm -hmm. Um, We all engage with screens. That's not going away. But in relationships, I think a greater percentage of time now more than ever is spent sitting next to each other on a couch, watching different screens, checking different feeds, this, that, and the other. And that really keeps you from sort of discovering what you really like about each other and whether you are, you know, a match. Yeah, yeah. No, 100%. And like uh, the the point that you brought up about being just sitting beside each other and <laughs> being in actually being physically in the real world, but our minds are connected just with each That's other right. in the virtual world where you can just like put down your phone and say, hey, what's going on? You know, talk yeah, to me. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And like this was, I mean, I, I've sat with like young, at restaurants and seen in the pre-COVID days and seen young couples who are like as concerned with taking the food picture for their social oh. media <laughs> As I mean, really nice restaurants in New York City, and they're like, you know, both taking yeah. food pictures. I mean, there's nothing, it's nothing wrong with that. And I, but at the same time, you know, relationships are built on the foundations of like commu- communication, conversation, shared experiences, et cetera. Yeah. And when we have these devices pulling us, our right. minds yeah. elsewhere, yeah. you know, it's just, it's not so productive. Oh, but certainly it's enabled relationships to yeah. be long distance more. It's there's mm. a, there's a positive side too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, for example, my, I have an au pair who lives with us who helps me with my kids mm-hmm. and she has through this COVID crisis been able to be in regular FaceTime conversation with her family. Exactly. Yeah. That's huge. Yeah. That's huge. It so it's is not huge. always bad. You just have to be conscious and mindful about 100%. it. hundred uh, percent. I, I think with so many other problems, it's, it's so much layered. I think the level of consciousness and the level of being aware about it, that is very, very important. As you said, like technology has so much, so great benefits. Uh, my mom, she's back in India, like my entire family is back in India. And I'm so glad that I have, uh, you know, I can just pick up my phone and just whatsapp call them totally totally i mean that's really important yeah yeah and it's just uh, you should be a a bit aware that are you are you being the master of that tool or that tool is being the master (laughs) of you you know you have to just uh think about you know what they say about things that are free if you, uh, if you don't have to pay for a product, you are the product, right? <laughs> yes, yes, hundred and twenty percent, hundred and twenty percent. And another, another very important thing, like as you said, like in relationships, when we are, uh, relationship is about shared experiences and all of those things. Uh, one of the things that uh, One Love is focusing on is to teach people that love, like learning to love, is a skill. So, what is how can someone love uh, someone other better? The original goal, which still remains a goal, is like what happens to Yardley, we don't want it to happen to anybody else. Yeah. Now, of course, that's a North Star. It happens every day. Three women a day in the U.S. are killed by their partners, for example. Mm-hmm. But we want to reduce that number. So that's where we started. How do we prevent domestic violence? But what we realized pretty quickly is that back to what we talked about at the beginning, young people don't think that they can be victims of domestic violence. They have yeah. stereotypes about who that is and what they mm-hmm. look like and where that happens. Yeah. It's not at their university or in their high school. Mm. So we realized that to teach what we needed to teach, we needed to talk about relationship health, not violence and abuse. So all mm. of our programs um, anchor to this idea of healthy and unhealthy relationships. Mm. The two most, in the early years, we started our national campaign in 2015. So by 2016, the two most common questions coming out of our programs were, how can I help a friend? So that was important because our programs were making them realize they had a friend that needed help. And we know that, for example, young women 16 to 24 are at three times greater risk of being in an abusive relationship than any other demographic. Mm -hmm. So we were educating and people were going, oh, my gosh, I have a friend who's in trouble. Sort of like my reaction when I saw the film the first time. The second question they ask is, what does healthy look like? Mm -hmm. And that's when we realized what you were saying earlier. A lot of us don't have healthy models for what healthy love looks like. But we believe that this framework and this language and this focus and this mindfulness can help you learn how to have healthier love, how to love better. So our our latest campaign is called Love is Learned, Mm -hmm. because what we want young people and everyone to understand is love is not just an emotion or a feeling. It's actually a skill you can build. 
Yeah. And you start by educating yourself with this framework and these tools and then practicing in your lives and sharing your knowledge with other people. Mm. So um, we think it's we think it's as important to teach the healthy as the unhealthy. Um, being able to spot the warning signs can help prevent abuse, mm. but being able to practice the healthy signs can help us all live healthier lives. I mean, I think the I mentioned earlier the healthier our relationships, the better our health and the better our outcomes in yeah, life. Yeah. So it's not just ending abuse anymore. It's also saying, how do we have healthier lives? Yeah. Like talk, talk to me about a couple of signs of a healthy relationship. Yeah. So, um, I mean, there's, there's many, I would refer yeah. to trust as one of the most important. Yeah. There's 10 signs that we teach. Mm -hmm. Trust is most is one of the most important in my book. Um, mm. And actually when, when I met my husband many years ago, the one thing that I never really felt in a relationship before is I could totally trust him. Like mm. I didn't have any of the anxiety about how he felt about me or whether he was going to flirt with other people or this, that. it was, I knew he was there for me. I knew he had my back. And over time he proved that to me, like he mm. didn't violate that trust. So I think mm. that's super mm. important because for me personally, having a trusting relationship was like a breath of fresh air, like not having to worry about the drama and status and this, that, and the other, just be like, this is my person and yeah. we can trust each other. Yeah. Um, I think taking responsibility and it's taking responsibility Oops. is very linked to my favorite one. And the one I struggle with the most, which is healthy conflict. Okay. So conflict is normal in a relationship. 100% normal. It's hmm. it's you can't avoid conflict. It's part of getting along with another human being is you're going to disagree sometimes. 100%. Learning to have healthy conflict where you listen to each other and hear each other and when you feel that rage come up in your stomach, you go, I'm going to ask more questions versus speak right now. Like these things um but part of that is also taking responsibility. Yeah. You know, in unhealthy relationships, frequently when like, let's say somebody said, you know, I feel like you're belittling me, that example yeah. I gave earlier. When the person says to you, I'm so sorry, tell me more, I would never mm. want to do that. That's one response. The other response is, why are you so sensitive? Your mom's sensitive too. Like yes. the other response is not me, it's <laughs> you. <laughs> yeah. So I think that piece of taking responsibility and and being kind and listening and trusting that if your partner has brought up that they're cons that they have a concern that you take them seriously. So I think those are some of them, but some of the others just the equality yeah. um, are people equally contributing to decisions about where you go to dinner and what you do and who you spend time with um, respect uh, valuing each other's beliefs and opinions that can be really hard in the polarized world we live in right now, but it's an important one comfortable pace. Sometimes yeah. relations, some, somebody wants to rush ahead. Somebody's not yeah. ready being able to, that's the calibration I was talking to, True. Uh, talking about. And then I would say the one that is like, you sort of want to say, oh, that's obvious, but fun. You should oh, actually no, that's have not obvious. <laughs> you should not feel like you're yeah. walking on eggshells. You should yeah. not feel like, yeah. you know, I use the metaphor, which you asked me about, about oxygen. Like you should feel like mm. your relationship's giving you oxygen, not taking it away. Mm. Um, so sometimes relationships, you get in the business of just keeping the relationship going. Yeah. When And that's not so fun sometimes because maybe oh. the relationship's not supposed to. So focusing yeah. on having fun and whether this feels like a positive relationship in your life is super important. 120%. Those are some of the great signs of a healthy relationship one of the key points that you mentioned that i could so relate to is when 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 my girlfriend would bring up something and i'd be like that's such a small thing but that's a small thing for me <laughs> not for exactly her. so that's so intent and impact <laughs> like it may be a small thing for you but yeah. as soon as you understand yeah. that it's a big thing for them but again, I teach, I teach this. I'm trying to get people to think about it. And still I do find myself making the same mistake over yeah. and over sometimes. Yeah. So yeah. my husband drives too aggressively in my opinion. Uh. He also, <laughs> I'm more conservative. He thinks that I'm a backseat driver. Right. You're just like, no. So we have this constant thing in our relationship where we're not actually, I can't stop from going, Oh, stop. You know? And he's like, uh. why are you talking from the backseat again? So you're going to have patterns like that in your relationship, which are the things that you're always going to see differently, mm -hmm. but trying to as on many of as many of those as you can understand where the other person's coming from is important. 
Hundred percent, hundred percent. I think I think that's very important. That just knowing the fact that you don't know enough, um, and just trying to understand, as you said, like just just talk to me about it. That's one simple sentence that you can use. Tell me more about it. You know, those are the language and vocabulary that we need to use in uh, in our daily lives. One of the primary points that you pointed out is for friends and family. Like in Yardley's case. The, their friends and family they didn't know that this is what's happening why why do you think or or rather than why um how can like is just is it just like learning about 10 signs of unhealthy relationship is the way to go uh, when it comes to friends and family helping out someone else or is it more layered it is more about um creating an atmosphere of trust so that the other person can talk about it being more vulnerable because a lot of times we don't talk because it's it's a shame we are less confident about it we are shameful we are fearful of judgment no so i think it is layered i think mm. the baseline layer is understanding what you're seeing and mm. that to me comes to the 10 signs mm. Mm. um i think that knowing what intensity looks like knowing what manipulation is yes. if we don't otherwise we excuse it away so we have to know what we're looking at first but then you have to be very thoughtful about how you engage. So mm. as I got into this work, one of the mistakes I realized that I regularly made with friends when I was growing up is when I saw things that just didn't feel right, I didn't know what to call them, mm. but I would usually just say, you should just break up with that person. They're not yeah. good for you. <laughs> That's not easy. No, no detail, no explanation, just break up with that person. Yeah, That yeah. never works. I learned very quickly that never works because your friend is in a relationship with that person. They care about them. Mm -hmm. And if it's an abusive relationship, the partner is probably saying she's totally against us. She doesn't want us to be together. Yeah. So when I come in and say, you should break up, I'm like reinforcing that narrative yeah. um, versus saying, showing this, uh, some more like a layered empathy, which is, I just feel like you guys, I know you're just starting to date and you're spending a lot of time together but a lot of the stuff that you really used to love to do, you're just not doing anymore. So mm -hmm. like you used to love club soccer, you used to love whatever, you used to love listening to music on the weekends with us. Like, I just don't want you to lose that stuff. Like a healthy relationship is two independent people who also come together and have fun. But I feel like you're losing some of the stuff that you love mm -hmm. the most. Mm -hmm. So instead of going after the person, describing and building empathy around some of the things you're seeing, mm -hmm. um, we also tell people, if the relationship is more like in the abusive realm and a friend or a family member knows it, like if you feel like somebody's life is in danger, you need to take more extreme steps, like reaching yeah. out to the national domestic violence hotline or, you mm -hmm. know, intervening at the local level, if you feel like you need police support or whatever. But, but there's a phase before that um, where the most important thing to do, if somebody's like, say in a, pretty emotionally abusive relationship and they've sort of lost their footing. And by the way, this can be men and women. So oh, I think yeah. it's really important to say that men are in abuse, emotionally abusive relationships too. Mm, um, mm. We have these weird ideas of who's the, who's the strong and who's the strong and who's the weak, but emotionally, emotional abuse is sort of an equal opportunity offender. True. true. Um, know that the most important thing to do is keep the lines of communication open. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. You know the signs, you've seen them, you've tried to say things like, I feel like you've lost your independence, or I feel like whatever it is. The most important thing to say is, I just want you to know, I love you always. I'm always here for you. Hmm. Um, if you try to lecture them and tell them what to do, you're only mimicking the behavior of the abusive person. Yeah. Because that's what a lot of abusive partners do. So you yeah. instead, you have to create this space. And it's I think one of the most frustrating things when I first got into this space was it felt like there should be something more I could do. But the answer is you need to be there for them and they need to know that you love them completely. And you're exactly. always there no matter yes. what. Yes. And that, yes. that I think is something everyone should know. Um, you're absolutely right. Because as a friend and family, it, 
you know it becomes tough to know how much can i intrude in someone's life um and how much to pull back and it's that's very important so one of the key things to do over there is to not lecture them instead like just listen to them create that space of trust and so that they can really be vulnerable in front of you and talk their heart out that is very important because sometimes the the victims might know the solution to their problem you know it's not that you have to tell them they might know the solution to the problem it's just that sometimes m- they are less clear about it and the more they talk about it they might become a bit more um clear you know so that is that is yeah. very important i also think i've worked with sometimes with um because now that i do this for a living i hear mm-hmm. from people who have concerns and i you know i've concerned about my somebody could say i'm concerned about my sister or my brother or whoever um one of the things that's important to acknowledge is it is exceptionally frustrating to be a friend or family member of somebody in an abusive relationship mm-hmm. because you just go why is it not obvious to them why don't they mm-hmm. just leave yeah. maybe she just loves drama maybe he's just xyz and that's called victim blaming to be really mm-hmm. honest like mm-hmm. victim blaming is is a failure to acknowledge sort of what this person has been through that makes them paralyzed yeah. so i think yeah. it's really important it's normal to have those frustrations and to be really frustrated that the person doesn't just leave but it's important to find outlets for saying that that mm-hmm. aren't to the person that cool. aren't like why don't you just leave i think you're just crazy why don't you ever yeah. listen to me like that's not constructive but having your own being able to talk to others about that to vent some mm-hmm. of that frustration mm-hmm. and to say look i know it's not their fault but they just don't leave and mm. do that elsewhere not in front of the person who is um struggling yeah. oh 100% i think i think that's that's very very important um to not just like blame them all the time uh, you're yeah, just knowing better vocabulary and a, a lot of times you know like in in conflicts as well we end up blaming the person where we should have just blamed the idea or the approach and a lot of times people just take it to their heart um so that is that is very important like learn better vocabularies when you're addressing or uh, trying to help and also there's another thing you know a lot of times um, family and friends might live in regret that oh you know we always want to try try so much and when something happens we end up blaming ourselves as well so don't blame yourself as much as time you have try to learn much more about that person and mm-hmm. see if like identify and um, know the signs like these another another very important question that kiri uh, comes up is what are the reasons that someone might end up staying in a relationship for a long time and how can they shorten it like one way is obviously identifying the signs but why in first place someone actually stays that long I, again, I, it's every situation is a little different. Sometimes there's financial dependency. Sometimes there's, um, you know, cultures where it's not acceptable to leave. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes there's children that people worry about, yeah. um, and, and then economic cost to leaving, which is real. Some I, a lot of people I know who are married and not in great relationships worry about custody and losing mm-hmm. their children, and they would rather stay and protect the children than um, than not be around. So there's some really real things um the, there's a lot of reform needed in the divorce courts to be perfectly honest um so but that's once you're married and once you have children and further down the road now some of those things are you could be young and have kids and financial dependency and all these things too but let's just talk about like a unhealthy and borderline emotionally abusive relationship why do you stay mm-hmm. um i think the first thing i like to say is that and some people disagree with this i i see all of these relationships when we think about abuse and victim there is no word there's no room for love in there it's like the person hurting the other person the person receiving the hurt i think of emotionally abusive relationships unhealthy relationships as a really sick love mm. so when you look at it through that lens there is caring there there actually are good moments and what i find two things i would say when the good moments happen the person who is um in the un- who's receiving the unhealthy um thinks this is the way i knew it could be i knew it could be this way we're going to get back to this place and frequently partners will say i just want it to be like it was in the beginning when everything was good and that calling back to the possibility and the potential 
keeps people there. Even mm-hmm. when all the data would show like it hasn't been good for a long time or the bads are really bad. Mm-hmm. So I think that's one thing is like, you can't, it's not as, it's not black and white. These are relationships. These are human beings. And it's, it's, it's nuanced. Um, I also think that the effect over time, you know, gaslighting is not one of our 10 signs as we label it, but gaslighting is a phenomenon that involves our 10 signs like manipulation or take, not taking responsibility, deflecting responsibility. What is, what is gaslighting? Gaslighting is sort of similar. Um, so let's just make a scenario up. So why did you stay out until three in the morning? I didn't know where you were. I have to get away from you because you are so possessive and you're so like, I need my space. It's your problem, not mine. You're so insecure. It's a beating down that happens, like a a wear down of a person's confidence in Mm -hmm. their own judgment. So back Mm -hmm. to that, trust your gut. When you've been in a relationship with somebody who every time you try to raise a concern, they tell you it's your fault. Mm -hmm. Over time, you sort of lose, yeah, you lose like conviction about what you should do. And um, I would say the third thing I would point to is I find the biggest misconception of people who end up in abusive relationships is that they have low self-esteem. A lot of people would like to think these are people with self-esteem problems. I think of self-esteem problems as a, as an effect, not a cause. Hmm. So this cycle of emotional abuse and gaslighting can cause self-esteem problems for sure, but it's not, many of the people who end up in abusive relationships, I would actually characterize more as helpers. Hmm. They want to see the best in the person. They want to help them through this hard time. They want to give of themselves. And so they end up over time getting taken advantage of. And so all of these things mean that it's very complicated to give a simple explanation for why people stay. Hmm. Um, And it's also, I would not be so naive to say, just knowing the signs will help you get out. Although I think having a language helps you pull out of the emotion. I, we, we actually had a supporter tell us she received our 10 signs card. She wasn't a supporter yet. <laughs> and she looked at the 10 signs and realized she had recently gotten divorced. On the, 10, on, the, on the healthy signs, she said, I didn't have one of these. Whoa. And so that realization, she's like, oh my gosh, like I thought this was about Yardley was killed or people get killed. I was married for a long time yeah. and I had just completely lost focus that there was not healthiness in my relationship. And meanwhile, mm-hmm. I had half of the unhealthy signs. Mm-hmm. So I think it's almost like you get, just keep moving on and doing life. And, and for all these reasons, people stay in the unhealthy zone. Frequently there's unhealthiness on both sides. Yeah. yeah. So it's just part of your like drama. Like yeah. we, we all know those people. Oh, they just love drama. They're like up and down and all around and this, and that becomes something you get a little bit like addicted to. It's just like a sa- mm. it's like a spike in your that gives you the dopamine that it does. exactly exactly. So <laughs> there's lots of reasons. There's probably more that I didn't mention, yeah, but those yeah. are just some of them. No, hundred percent. I, I I totally agree. Like I think I think uh, back in the day, even I used to think about me as a saint. Like oh, I'll I'll take everything. You know, it's just that I'm getting hurt, right? I'll try not to hurt that person, you know, not leave because that person might get hurt. And all of those yeah. things is, is self-love is also a thing. You should love yourself a bit, yes, you know, definitely. because like one of the best relationship advice I think you were given was we must be our own before we can be uh, another's. Right. So, oh yeah, that's good. Yeah. That, it's um, that's true. I mean, a lot of the young people we teach talk about self-love is really important. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the only thing I'm always wary of when it comes, it takes a while to learn to love yourself. 100%. It's not just something like if you haven't figured it out yet, you haven't figured it out yet, but you yeah. can just, it's a journey, yeah. but just know like you will bring, if you, if you don't love yourself, it's difficult to be in um, not impossible, but it's hard to be in a really loving relationship because you're your own worst enemy to a certain extent. But again, 100%. that's a journey for each of us on our own. hundred percent. And I think, I think it's, um, you know, like when you know yourself better, you know that how faulty you are. So you empathize with other people a bit more. <laughs> all right. So empathy, it's all about empathy. Empathy, yeah. a mad intent, intent is different from impact, empathy, listening, like, um, back to trust, like yeah. coming with a sincere desire to show respect to the person that you're in a relationship with, 
you know, it just focusing on these things won't make you perfect, but I do think it um, can really help and really can lead to healthier relationships in your life. Yeah. Hundred percent, like developing your own patterns um, in your own style. That what that's what we talk, spoke about. Uh, before I ask my last question, Katie, um, where can people know a bit more about One Love, your efforts in it? Um, where should they go? Yes, yeah, so our website is joinonelove.org. It's all letters: J O I N O N E love.org. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, on our website. So we raise money philanthropically. So people donate to us so that we can create these incredible film tools and toolkits and this, that, and the other. And it's basically accessible to anyone in the world. So if Mm -hmm. you want to learn more, you go to our website. Um, We've launched uh, an education center or it will be launching. It'll be live, live in the next few weeks, but basically it will enable anyone who wants to learn how to use our films and discussion guides to be trained online. Hmm. And what's been amazing about this, actually, since the TED Talk, the global interest has actually grown quite a bit because TED has such a global audience. And we have had people translating our 10 signs into Mandarin and doing workshops in Ghana. And like, it really is a human issue. Um, And while there are different cultural like overlays and stories and how it plays out, the truth is when it comes to the 10 signs, they're pretty human. And Hmm. so um, we want to create these tools and over time, just build a library of content where people can come in and say, this is what's good for me. This is what's good for me. So yes. um, joinonelove.org is where you go for all of that. And you can follow us on social. We're on Instagram, Snapchat, Facebook, yeah. Twitter. Yeah. Um, and we'd love to have you there. I, I loved your Instagram page. I mean, it's so lit. The, the, I, th- I think there are a lot of young people working with you. They are just, yes. uh, I, I think, Jaleesa Tucker, I think. She, Jaleesa, she's Jaleesa, awesome. Jaleesa, yeah. She's so much fun to um, like see her interviews uh, over there. And yeah, like uh, I'll, I'll, I'll be putting everything in the show notes as well so that people can quickly go and visit and find these resources. My last question to you, Katie, is if I give you a megaphone and you want to shout out a message the lesson that you know now and you wish you had known this before, what would it be? I wish I had known earlier that you, you make your own path. I think when you're young, you're trying to find the paths that others approve for you. And you're not focused on learning the path that's right for you based on what's in your heart and in your gut. Um, So I think you waste a lot of time comparing yourself to others and thinking about what, what's, what will people value and what does success look like here or there versus thinking like, again, back to my favorite expression, like what gives me oxygen? You know, I truly believe like each one of us has with our, with our strengths and weaknesses has been put here to figure out like, why am I here? And I think if we just follow the prescriptions that society has put out for what success looks like or what somebody like me does or what my family will approve of, um, we're going to miss it. We're going to miss it. And I mean, I think, you know, I started out my career in investment banking, um, which anyone who knew me in college was like, what are you doing? (laughs) Like, this doesn't make any sense. And honestly, I had a great experience on one level. It was like professional boot camp. I learned from the best professionals about how to be a professional, but truthfully, I wasn't that happy because it's not, it was success to a lot of other people and it was not success. I think that idea that you make your own path is one that I wish I had had confidence in when I was younger. Yeah. Find your own path. hundred percent. All right. So guys, one love is out there. They are teaching about healthy and unhealthy relationships, the stats around abusive relationships and the effect of it on our society, on our individual levels, how serious this important this issue is. Katie and her team are doing exceptional work. They are raising funds, creating awareness. And it's not just about romantic relationships. It's about our friendships, our, our parent-child relationship. A lot of our relationships, and especially in a lot of other fields that we want to grow, can grow if we have if we have healthy relationships. Go follow One Love on joinonelove.org. Follow their Instagram page and um, support them and learn. They are shortly launching the education center. So go spam them. Uh, like just just <laughs> just shower the love. Yeah. All right. So um, 
thank you so much thank you so much katie for doing this it it truly means a lot you saying yes and um, there are so many great lessons that i think uh, not just me when when i broadcast it to the world there'll be a lot of values that a lot yeah. of people yeah listen thank you for reaching out i think that um it's easy to get discouraged in the world but i think this focus on there are lots of people out there trying to make the world a better place yeah. and i just appreciate that that that's part of what you're trying to do too so thank you for having me today 100% all right guys uh this is amit pandey and you were listening to wish i knew that before see you next time